so um, we're gonna get through most of this. So I actually have a section on Doctavec um, as well, but we're uh, Doctavec is not in the assignment. So if you know we get close to the end of the class, we'll just leave Doctavec out. But I want you guys to have the notes because Doctavec is another form of Wordsvec, and um, but I also don't want to run over because it's the end of the semester, and so it's more just FYI. Some extra notes in case you ever get the need or the chance to run a doc to back. But first, we should probably cover what the heck word to back is. So we're going to extend everything we've done in the second half of the semester now into uh, neural net models. So what we've been doing are vector space models. And vector space models, okay, good. Um, allow us to build a representation of text and you know it's either uh, represented as the relationship between rows and columns or in a network model we can convert that into nodes and the, the strength between nodes might be the similarity or some other um, count functions and we're going to now think about the company of word keeps so Many weeks ago, I said, you know a word by the company it keeps. And that works pretty well in these vector space models um, in the sense that documents that contain the same types of words are likely about the same types of things. And the words that are seen in the same documents are probably have a similar meaning. Right? Um, but that totally ignores word order. So now we're going to get into models that um, use word order as an important facet. So these are going to be neural models, um, so vector space models plus context, basically. And this is often called word embeddings. I see people use this phrase, word embeddings, kind of loose and fast to mean a lot of different things. Um, we could consider what we've been doing as a word embedding because we're uh, mapping words into numeric vectors, so we're embedding them as numbers. And often this is people kind of like kind of where they're using it. So they talk about um, the word embeddings, meaning the vector that that word um, has across documents okay, or dimensions and the numbers in there. Okay. And that would represent pretty much any type of vector space or neural net model you would do. Um, but when I think about word embedding as a more like classically trained cognitive psychologist, I think about where the word is embedded in the sentence. So we can also capture that using neural networks. And some examples include word to vec which is mostly what we're going to focus on today. You can also do fast text, which is Facebook's version of word to vec word to vec developed by Google. Glove is Stanford's version, um, but it requires the use of Java, and we all know how much we love Java, <laughs> so we won't cover GloVe. Um, mostly because GloVe, uh, the GloVe models kind of assume you're loading a pre-built like English model, and we're going to actually work on how to build our own here. That's a little more flexible for us. And these are just really useful. If I think about word embedding as either just a set of numbers or as the um, representation of words in context, it allows me to calculate similarity, which we've been doing all semester. Right? Um, it could be used for classification. We'll do an example of that today. Um, semantic classification. So people have used this to group things into categories. Uh, so words that have similar meanings. Or it could be used for text classification. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Whew, these trees, man. Um, text classification where we're grouping thing documents that are similar and more so many things we can do now i wouldn't say that word to vec is particularly useful for dimension reduction right so with topics models the most common approach is to take many documents and try to reduce them into a smaller handful of topics so the point is to crunch the number of dimensions into some small number i can work with five ten right um, three or four. With LSA, we're often calculating many dimensions because we're trying to capture many faceted different pieces. You can do that with topics. 
but I feel like when people when people are trying to do topics, they try to crunch. Like factor analysis. You don't want 500 factors. Right? You want four. Um, so word to vec is more of the LSA style. It's meant to capture many, many dimensions. So it's generally a bigger, more rich representation. You could do four dimensions, but I just don't think the model would run very well. Or it might run, but it don't it doesn't predict. So this is a neural net model. And so I want to cover very briefly what are neural nets and how do they work. Okay. <clears throat> And the reason they're called neural nets is because they, uh, as a model, try to represent the way that neurons work in the brain. And I remember first encountered these and um, tried to, mostly was writing them with Perl. If any of you it's a lot old school, showing my age, um, uh, models of, of many hashed arrays here, but they're trying to capture this fact that that we we don't have like a cat neuron right here in the brain. It's not a cat is represented right here with this neuron right here. Right? The, the representation of objects and things and events is spread across the brain. And so a, a thing like apple right, is represented by many neurons firing at the same time. So the one for color, the one for shape, uh, semantics, semantics, what it's used for, uh, etc. And so we're, we, you know, in a network model, we have these little nodes that represent apple, and we're saying, well, this bubble is apple. But practically, in our brain, what happens is you get this pattern of activation, right? Life experience, etc. So everybody's patterns are slightly different. Okay. And a neural net model is organized into layers okay, that represent these interconnected processes that we know happen in the brain. So when things, uh, let's say vision here, um, you know, the light waves hit the eyeball, it goes back through, um, goes through a bunch of stuff in the front of the brain, but most of the action happens in the back of the brain, right? and then sends more information back through the front. So, you know, at the back of the brain, we're, ca we're capturing um, shape, color, orientation, slant, and so there's a bunch of neurons firing that send that information to the parietal lobe, Ah, ah, ah. Hold on, wait. Just give me the food. <laughs> You're going to have to find something to distract you. It might be very hard. <laughs> you have cheese? Yeah, I have cheese. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Two seconds. You see, there's a, I'm going to close my door. <laughs> zoo in here. A zoo. Okay. Um, so it goes from the back, right, the occipital lobe, into the parietal lobe. That's where most of the action occurs for pulling things from memory. So you can remember how you first met an apple or what apples taste like, etc. So we know that it's like there's all these connections in the brain. Specifically, language, there's this whole complicated connection between uh, uh, Wernicke's area in the front and Broca, right, Broca's area in the front and Wernicke's area in the back of the, the frontal and parietal lobe, and there's all these connections in between them, so why not build models that look like that? Sorry about the interruption. And to me, the nice thing is they represent that we don't really totally know what the brain is doing. So we don't really know all the different pieces of what the brain is, is happening, going on. There's a lot of, of areas where there's just like neurons firing and we're not quite sure. Okay. And um, in the models themselves, these nodes, right, these circles, are connected by weights. Right? And those weights are what we're going to adjust by using traits. And um, that's not unlike people, right? So the neurons have specific levels or thresholds that they fire with, and those are adjusted with training. So the more you see something, the less the threshold is because it, you know it already. Oh gosh, we went from small pictures to giant pictures. Okay, well, this is uh, an example of a word to vec bot or a simple, sorry, a simple neural net model. It's a bit, it's actually a, like a medical model, but it's just a good picture. So. Most simple neural net models have some sort of 
input layer, some sort of hidden layer, and an output layer. In a word spec model, the input layer is the, the words themselves okay. uh, in context order. So, you know, we might have five of them. The hidden layer always is just sort of this ambiguous gray zone that um, does the math. Okay. And the output layer is whatever word it expects in that context. Okay. And I have some more pictures in here in a minute. But in this particular case, what we might see is kind of a medical decision where if I have all of these inputs, Right, sex, cholesterol, age, it kind of runs through the model and suggests a specific drug as the output. Now, I could do a whole class on neural nets. We're doing one day. So I'm going to kind of very briefly touch on the topics, and there are lots of cool tutorials out there if you want to learn more. So there are a lot of in and outs here about neural nets. Sometimes they're called perceptron models. Sometimes they're called feedforward models or back prop models. That's about how they learn, right? Um, the, the main distinction in these types of models is shallow or simple models and deep neural net models, like what's deep learning. And everybody's like super fascinated with deep learning. We'll do some next week um, right now because the models can do almost anything. Uh, there's some limitations there, so we'll talk about that next week, but we'll do a simple model today and a deep learning model next week. Shallow models only have one hidden layer, okay? so it just makes them simple because there's just one input, output, and a hidden layer. Deep learning models, all that means is that they have multiple hidden layers. Okay? I love talking to non numbers people, and they're like, oh, but this deep learning, I'm like, do you know what that means? <laughs> like. This means there are two in layers or more. So it's just a little bit more mathematically complex. Like it doesn't, it isn't magic, right? It's math. So worth of itself is a shallow model because it's meant to only have one hidden layer. So are these better than vector space models? In theory, these models are better at capturing context because the context is explicitly embedded versus a vector space model that completely ignores context. But context would mean word order, okay, or sort of words surrounding it. Um, practically, sometimes that doesn't make them better predictors, but it does make them better representations of the text. And so what we've been doing is a bag of words approach. It, and that ignores order of the words and the link between the words. Are they next to each other in the same document? How far apart are they? Right? And, you know, practically, often that word context is not a huge deal because vector space models work. Topics models work. Right? They're very useful, um, you know, given the task. But, uh, I, I've always found that like people who are like, oh no, it has to be multi-word approach. I'm like, but does it? So I am not yet convinced that context is always necessary because these bag of words models capture that global context a little bit better. And we know that people when reading or listening only capture the gist or the global context anyway. So if a person doesn't remember exact word order, why would I build a model that needs that information? Now, sometimes they work great, sometimes they don't. It depends on the task and I think the data. So maybe they're better than vector space models, maybe they're not. And at the end of this class, hopefully you'll have the toolkit to test both of them, see which one works better. And so um, with Word to vec or neural nets, we can add that context, and this to me is where the embedding happens. We're embedding it in the context of the other words around it versus using embedding meaning the math vector. So a couple ways to do embeddings. There's two, SIBO or a continuous bag of words approach, can't escape bag of words, and uh, skip gram models. So it's like a SIBO. So a SIBO or continuous bag of word approach tries to think about the simple context, right? And this is often thought of as kind of this like moving window approach, kind of akin to how people read. Yeah. 
see if you guys can see this is a freaking zoo going on here. Probably not. No, you can just see the edge of the desk. There's a zoo. A zoo going on. So, alright. So, process akin to reading. Yes? Um, <clears throat> so, let's say I have a sentence. Uh, and then on this particular day I was writing these lecture notes, I have been working on lasso regression. I was trying to learn how to do it, and I'm not impressed because the data I had, it didn't help. But I would have said I've been running this lasso regression all morning. Okay. And trying to understand the word lasso there. So lasso, you know, kind of brings up to me this growing up in Texas, this like kind of a cow wrangling kind of thing. Um, but in this particular context, lasso interpretation here is surrounded by the word running so running a lasso seems weird okay, you don't really run lassos you spin them right uh and then regression is definitely a weird word if you've never heard of this stuff and so that context is very helpful it disambiguates which interpretation of lasso there is right um and if i had never seen someone give a talk on this i would have been like you're doing what regression with what <clears throat> A skipgram model um, interprets context by linking the moving window directly to each word. And I have a picture here in a second that I stole from this really great blog that I think clarifies the difference here. But a SIBO model says the context is the entire phrase, right? And all of their activations get averaged together. All of their, um, if all of their um, nodes get averaged together. That skip grand model says, well, you know, um, these, you know, I might have said I've been running um, a lasso regression all morning. That's basically the same thing. So any of the use of the word running or regression should hopefully bring this up. Okay. So each word is tied to the target word um, with a specific weight. And the target weights are sort of added rather than um, averaged. So, um, let me show you guys just this freaking zoo so you'll understand what's happening. One second. Okay. <clears throat> Since you guys like dogs, right? What happened to my Adobe window here? Come on, Adobe. I don't. Adobe's like freaking out. What's Adobe doing? Stop. One second. How do I? It's like totally broken. Can you guys still hear me? What is Adobe doing? Alright, stop being dumb. Pause and annotate. Change share display. Choose window share. Stop screen share. Ah. Okay, sorry. It froze. So, I know you guys love the zoo here. This is what's being distracting. How do I get them in the picture? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Completely crazy. They're just playing. <laughs> this, this is how we always play. Someone has, someone has a squirrel. The other person wants the squirrel. Can you distract one of them? Now everyone's happy because they have treats. <laughs> okay, so maybe now we can continue this lecture without any more interruptions. Apologies, but yeah, they do. But you know, you know, guys don't want to listen to that while I'm trying to talk about the fascinating ins and outs of skip gram models. <laughs> okay, this time with less noise. 
It's like that BBC thing with the children that run in and out. Okay. Let's look at the picture because the picture will clarify this, right? So on the left side here, we have a SIBO model where uh, the sentence here is, I'm selling these fine leather jackets. And let's say we're trying to predict the word fine. So the input layer of a word to vec model is the context, then the hidden layer does the math, right? And then the output layer is the word that should appear in that context. So word to vec models can be very good for predicting what word should come next. Um, and I, that's not really what they use for that Google search algorithm. I was, I'm fairly sure I read somewhere that it's like a Monte Carlo Markov chain kind of model. But they did develop word to vex and they might have used it for a while. Um, but, you know, at least that's what these models are meant to do. The output is not, you know, any particular prediction, but the outputs instead are, you know, what, what word should be involved in this context, which is a prediction, but, you know, the goal here is understanding word context. So on the left side in the SIBO model, the context is averaged across all of the activations of that piece. So you would have to, you know, you have um, all of these words kind of contribute to an average. In a skip gram model, each word is tied to it directly. So any one of them could bring up the output. And that's true if there's an especially strong relationship between uh, fine and leather here. Um, whereas here, the fine, the leather might get washed out. Uh, it makes all the other context words, but this one is so strong that it pulls through. So I think SIBO models are better at representing kind of a continuous context, hence the name. Skip frame models are better at representing collocates, okay, which we've talked about, which is word pairs. So which one's better? Well, I don't know. Um, research says that SIBO models are faster and often better with more frequent context. So in these kind of models, you don't have to take out stop words. Now you so it could, but you don't have to. Um, skip gram models are bare, better for rare combinations of words and work better with smaller training data. My own experience of working with both of these, I never really see a big difference between the two. Um, but in general, I am working with smaller data sets and rarer contexts. So it may be that, you know, they just kind of even out. All right, now we're gonna do this all in Python because the word to vec package in R is, I haven't looked at it lately, but the last time I looked at it, it's total crap. Okay, it assumes that you're going to load a pre-build model and you're gonna do it in the strange bin file, which is like the output of a word to vec model. And um, it doesn't do, I don't love it. Okay, I hope I'm wrong and it's gotten better, but Gensum, spot on, it's so great, I don't care. This is like, I love R, R is like my, my base language, right? But Python and wins this battle. <clears throat> so um, we're gonna look at the ABC corpus as our data example data set. This is the Australian Broadcasting Commission. This is a plain text corpus with a bunch of news articles. And here we go. And any any set of sentences and words would work. So Twitter. That's a lot of small data sets. You need a big training data set, but it's a lot of small context. Um, man, anything, right? Anything would work. So we're gonna use Gensum to build ourselves that word to vec model <coughs> with a key thing to note here. When we did uh, the LSA and the topics models, we converted those to a term by document matrix. Right, so we took that input text and we used some functions to create this TDM or document by term matrix, however, where it was words by document and the counts were what the numbers were. Okay. The um, way that a word to vec model works at its very simplest, right, is that you put in just a list of tokenized documents. Okay. So here we're going to put in a list of sentences, okay, so small context and um, it just has to be tokenized. So whatever you do first, you have to tokenize. Um, so for the model here, the simplest thing that you can do with no features or add-ons, which I don't recommend, but you could run these in one line, 
is uh, gensum.models.wordsavec. Here are my words. And this is why I love gensum. <laughs> this is so simple. The uh, model itself embeds the vocabulary, so a list of all the possible words. Fast text. We're going to do fast text. Um, I would argue that fast text and word to vec are basically the same thing with some slight tweaks in the computation underneath the hood, where fast text in theory purports to be better at rare context. But gensum wise, practically, they run, you would do gensum.models.fast text. Pretty much the same way. I have not used the fast text um, package. Specifically, like I have not used their their library thing um, and their system on the API because the API builds you like to build uh, it takes a pre-built model I think but um, where was I going with this brain fart because Jimson is easy. Yes. I don't think I think it's easier, but you might. I, it kind of depends on what you're doing, too. Like, the one bad thing to me about systems that require their own language is that's one more thing you have to learn, which, you know, fine, sure, fine. But, like, you know, I got to figure out, like, how to do their tutorial and how to command line install these things and, like, use it whereas with what we're doing um like with gensum this is why i love gensum it's all similar code and so i just need to know python right so i don't have to learn python and then oh yeah i've only used fast text i gotta learn this other thing this is not a bad thing for an analyst to have uh, um, a better a um a, a desire to learn multiple things but then uh yeah yeah, but I'm saying, like, I got to figure out, it's sort of Python. Oh, I guess you can do it in Python. But, like, you know, I have to learn their specific package. And I'm complaining about nothing right now, really. You got me off on a tangent. Because I was telling someone earlier that it wouldn't kill them to learn an extra package. So I don't really feel this way. The thing that I like about um, using Gensum and Python here is it's the same no matter if I'm doing word to vec or fast text. And it's equivalent to using their giant package. <clears throat> so I would argue that if I can apply the knowledge I already know and change the words from word to vec to fast text, that's easy. But that's my opinion. Anyway, so you got me off topic here. All right. <clears throat> uh, all right. So what can I do with a built model? So built a model, right? And I've listed, like, I can grab the vocabulary here. And I can find words that are similar based on context. So we can do the same sort of thing that we did before, where um, we find words that are similar. And now this case is not similar because they mean the same thing. Remember here, there's a similarity because they occur in the same types of contexts which we assume means they have similar features. Right? To do science, we get law, agriculture, policy, general, media, practice, etc. Um, and these are cosine similarities. So they're occurring around the same words. Okay. This does not mean that science and law are occurring together. That means that science and law are occurring in the same context. <clears throat> now what's actually happening? Well. Um, when the words go in, there's an activation. So it gives you an idea of what, um, what, like activation is this idea, I'm trying not to get too like neural cognitive, where, you know, something is happening and you're turning that thing on. So in the brain, activation is when a neuron fires, right, which means that it does its task, sends a message. In this type of model, it means that that node is lit up like a like a light switch. Okay. When that happens, it connects to everything connected to that node with the specific weight on those paths. Okay. 
And so activation can be a pattern, a pattern of, of context or a pattern of words that all feed into this hidden layer. And then the hidden layer computes, well, you know, given everything I've seen so far, the next word should be. And so this is the sort of this idea of like what happens when neurons are firing, what, what creates thought and movement and actions and like everything we do, breathing. And so in, to interpret, say, a picture, we have these patterns of neurons that are firing. This is where I was kind of trying to get at the beginning. We have the color, the lines, the curves, the semantic, the understanding of the relationship between the objects. 3D space is a totally different issue too. And that's represented in many different parts of the brain. Not just one spot. And uh, that mathematically is represented by softmax in a word to vex model. Softmax is really actually pretty popular for deep learning models as well. And what it is, is it is a function that predicts what word has the highest probability of being in that context given the pattern of activation that we've seen. And the denominator of a softmax function is all of the possible contexts in the vocabulary, and you know it's picking the one with the highest probability in the numerator, given the denominator. Uh, and so here's a tiny picture of a softmax, right? So here are all of our, I'm sorry, here's our input here. And the input here is coded as a one-hot vector. So it's actually more than a one-hot vector because in a, a word-to-vec model, the input is as big as the window size. So it might be four um, little activations. But remember, a one-hot vector is it's coded as zero and one. It's either on or off. And so we have the context of the words here. We get the little pattern of how many of our words we want. Those connect to the hidden layer right, where it... Um, uh, has the weights that are trained. So, you know, given this word is connected to this node at this rate. And then the softmax, this is kind of a, not a t great representation, um, but what softmax does is, is it calculates the probability of all of the vocabulary. Okay. So what's the context, the probability of the context being vocabulary word number one, number word two, etc. So this is a zoo example. Okay. And then the output is essentially whichever softmax uh, probability is the highest. Okay. And so that's how we get from the inputs to the outputs. Okay. There's some sort of linear activation here, meaning there's um, a weight on the connection between nodes that are on and the hidden layer. And then given the hidden layer, the, so the, the choice of the outputs is based on this kind of probability softmax calculation. So that's how it's getting the answer. There are other ways to do it, uh, but softmax is pretty popular. All right, so to use this in Gensum, what we'll do is uh, input a list of tokenized sentences, and you could stop there. Don't recommend this, though, because we've got some tweaking we can do here. And what we can add is minimum count. So this is the minimum number of times a word has to appear to stay in the vocabulary. And we kind of did that with our LSA where we cut out words at the bottom that weren't frequent enough. But if you set this to one, every word will get used. Um, size is the number of dimensions. This can be uh, as variable as you'd like it to be. 300 is popular. There are some, some research papers for suggestions on why 300 is popular, but that does not mean that it's the answer. So I've had models that worked really well with 1400. So this is a, um, a parameter a dimension that you can change. You can up it and down it until you find one that works best for you. Um, and it's really going to depend on the task, I think. Okay. Uh, so size here, remember size is not the window size, it's the size of the number of dimensions. This is the hidden layer size. Uh, workers is the number of threads to train a model. You can move that up and down depending on how good your computer is. Window is another important piece that you can tweak, and this is the, the size of the, the word window. Meaning, if I'm looking at target word right here in the middle, how many words before and after? So if I say five, that means five words with, with the target, I think, in that, in that window. 
Now, uh, sometimes when I see people do tutorials on Word to Vec, they have really large window sizes. So they're embedding a context of like 100 words. And I would tell you that does not represent the reality of our brain at all. We're good about seven to nine words, maybe max. And so I always recommend people go smaller here, right? Because that context, first of all, context is usually pretty specific, right? Um, as we go from large, small one grams to two grams to three grams to four grams, we, we get so specific that we only have seen it once. Um, without a huge data set size. And so the larger the window, the more specific the context, I think it's probably harder to predict because you have, if you think about softmax, many, many, many contexts that we've seen and um, it can't really collapse over them. Now, sometimes word window size being huge works well. So um, models don't necessarily have to represent what people do, um, but it's a good place to start. I don't know. I just I feel like if you were saying this model represents reading and what people do and then suggesting that people can remember 100 words at once, it seems a little silly. But I've seen it many, many ways. I tend to go smaller here. Uh, and then SG, so zero for SIBO, one for skip grant. And then there are actually other ones that you can tweak some super parameters, but not necessary for simple purposes. So let's try one. So I grabbed Jane Austen because uh, it's all um, out of copyright or whatever and um, it's all in this Jane Austen or package. And instead of actually processing these by sentence, it's processed line by line, but it's okay. Because we could pretend line by line is our document size. And so this just breaks it up into about 50 characters per, per line. Now, I'm just going to clean this data up, so I transferred it over into Python. I just created this as a list instead of a pandas data frame. And then I am going to use the simple preprocess function. So we looked um, in the topics modeling section and, and, and LSA at this like kind of complex processing function. Uh, here's a simple one. So simple preprocess, I think just lowercases everything. It is like very basic level stuff. Um, and you can look up what it does. Preprocess in some second spell. And so let's see here. Um, oh, that's table. It's simple preprocess. There we go. Okay, so it's going to convert it to a set of lowercase tokens, ignoring tokens that are too short or too long. So you could actually do min and max length. Okay, and that's it. But the nice thing about the, the one, it's fast. It's very fast. Um, the nice thing about this is that it returns that tokenization to us. We could also use an LTK to tokenize this um, or some other packages, but in LTKs it's pretty good. Um, brain fart, brain fart, or was this going? But we really don't have to do a whole lot. If we're considering context and we're thinking about reading, leave in all the stop words. Okay? Um, we could, well, you might have to fix some encoding issues, but in general, like, not a lot of text pre-processing is necessary. Right, the context might be the end of the sentence, okay, or a comma, and we could consider that part of the context if we wanted to. So you could go whole hog and completely, you know, kind of reduce the data, get rid of some of the stop words and stuff, or you could go simpler. Okay, I've done it both ways. I don't know that I find that it makes that much of a difference, but again, I'm working in like such a narrow window of what I'm doing that I always suggest I try it both ways, see which one works better. All right, so let's build one. We've, to we've put in our tokenized data. I made this a small number of dimensions because it's just sense and sensibility, right? I don't feel like there's um, 500 dimensions in sense and sensibility, but I could be wrong. Um, there's probably 100 dimensions in that. So remember, dimensions is the number of kind of like 
themes or ideas that you expect to be going on in the text. I did a window size of six. It has to occur at least twice before I get to use, so no singletons. And um, workers equals four works pretty good on my computer. If your models are chugging along and taking a long time, change that number down. All right. So let's look at the most similar to Eleanor, who's a character in the book. Um, himself, okay, which is a little weird because that's a woman. <laughs> uh, Lucy, okay, another female character. Though, then, however. So what context-wise, what's happening is the uh, the character's name is occurring in the same types of places as the beginning of the sentence. Um, duty here, girl again off. And therefore object. So I really wanted to use this to highlight that the, the similarity calculation here is a cosine similarity of the word embeddings. Okay, so you can grab the word embeddings and get words by dimensions and the numbers there. And that represents how it's relating to the hidden layer. Um, uh, but the similarity is based on context, so there are words that appear, occur in the same types of words around them. And that's a different question than a LSA model, which is words that appear in the same types of documents. Okay, so there's a different piece here. And this, to me, is not super useful because I, well, I guess I know Eleanor is a girl, but, like, I don't know that I would ever think these, again, in Eleanor are related similar wise, like meaning wise. So this similarity here is that it occurs in the same types of context. Let's try skip gram. So all I've done is change from zero to one. And do notice you get a very different answer. So now maybe I'm getting some things that make sense, right? Eleanor is matched with Marianne and Lucy and Edward. So now we're matching these to characters in the book. Um, great little, so some adjectives that are used probably to describe the characters. Speak, mention, make it a little more sense. So here the skip gram model makes a, um, a bit more sense. Uh, duty, horse, mistake, match, I don't know about these. Goodness, solicitude, weird word, circumstance. But I think this one seems a bit more sensible to me. For sense and sensibility, unintentional there. Eleanor, Marianne, and Lucy, and Edward, those kind of, okay, the main characters. So if you want to learn more about these two bad boys, I pulled some of the pictures from this Medium article, uh, ignore the Java part at the bottom, okay. uh, and then there's an illustrated words effect. It's just really great and goes into those like fine grain details um, on this GitHub site. So, you know, Medium has a bad habit of only letting you see so many things, but this is a GitHub site, so it's pretty open. Now let's change tactics here. So what can I do with a word to vec model? Well, it looks like at the moment all I can do is predict similar words and predict words that come next. But what you can really do with a word to vec model is take the, the data out of it and do something else with it. So we're going to do some simple classification, and this is a tutorial from um, Towards Data Science. And uh, we haven't covered a whole lot of classification in this course because I do it more in my other um, NLP course. And the real question is, like, a neural net model is kind of like a complex thing. I can grab the words to dimensions matrix pretty easily from G Jensen. Right? And I've used that for projects where I have words by dimension. And that works really well for very large data sets because kind of this averaging over all these contexts and does a little bit less of this weird, um, you know, duties tied to horse kind of thing. Um, easy enough. I could grab that matrix and use it to predict words or predict um, similarities. But generally what people want is uh, predict the classification of a specific text piece, right? So let's say I'm trying to classify if something is, is um, spam or, or a real email, right? I'm trying to classify that document. 
before that was easy. We took the document matrix, so the document by dimensions matrix. But here we don't have that. We have the words by dimensions matrix because that's how the model is built. Right? But we don't have a words by documents matrix because that got embedded. So what we can do is um, use a function that I found in the book and a couple of other places that basically kind of cre recreates this documents by dimensions matrix. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, okay, so we're going to grab data from Stack Overflow. And the Stack Overflow data is just a a list, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a data frame, data frame is the word I'm looking for here, of some posts. And I only took the Python, C++, and PHP posts to make this a simple classification. I mean, it's three categories, but there's like 30 in this original data set. So I'm going to do, can I predict the difference between these three languages? Because they're somewhat similar. Okay, they're not perfectly similar. But they've got similar features, right? All right. So we can do simple pre-process, um, or we can do a bigger function like we've covered before. We could take out symbols, stop words, lower casing, and HTML codes. So in this case, I might take out stop words and see what happens. Um, but because this data is from the internet, we should be careful to not assume spelling. And since this is coding questions especially, because you know not half those words are not spelled appropriately, right? All right, so we've grabbed this function that uh, allows us to take out some of these symbols. Now, in a um, in a set of data that has um, code as parts of the question. It might be interesting to leave them in, but it also might be confusing because um, they're going to have a lot of these similar kinds of brackets and ats, and um, this is a comma and a semicolon, right? So it might be better to just kind of take out the code and leave in just like the function names. Um, here we're going to take out the rest of the symbols altogether, so we're just going to grab numbers in A to Z, and this will remove any kind of weird non-Latin symbols. Uh, this one is going to pull out stop words. So I'm going to clean this data set. We're using beautiful soup. This is specifically LXML. Um, this is uh, XML and HTML combined. So I'm going to grab all of that and toss it because I don't want it because none of these questions are about HTML. I know PHP is kind of HTML-y, but this um, PHP is included in HTML, but this is going to grab specifically that, uh, those HTML tags, right? Because we don't want that. Uh, we're going to lowercase, uh, take out all these weird symbols and replace them with a space, take out anything else that it can't read well and replace it with nothing, and then take out the stop words. Okay. So uh, before I didn't take out stop words, now I am. Let's see what difference that makes. Uh, now I've got that function. I'm going to apply it. So the dot apply function is very similar to the apply function in R. Uh, this will apply this on this column one row at a time. And now we have a bit more of just the words that they're using and not any other to be and of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so let's build some models. We're going to treat this like a machine learning problem because that's what it is. And we're going to split the data into a training data set to build the model with and a testing data set to see if the model's any good. And so I'm going to do that with, let me make this a little bit bigger here, um, the test train split function from scikit-learn. So we'll take x train test, y train, y test, putting that into x and y. So the x variable is the actual text. The y variable here is the answer we're trying to predict. We're going to do an 80-20 split. And you can pick any random state you want. Okay, so we've got training data sets, testing data sets. Caveat, I have seen people use the entire data set to build a word to vec model and then just predict a specific test piece. Um, that's kind of up to you. 
I think it could go either way because you want a words effect model to see more context right? um, and create those dimensions better. And so you can train it on the entire X variable, but only test it while you're tweaking on part of Y. So I've seen this both ways. Here we're doing just a complete split. So remember, we've got to have a tokenized set of documents rather than individual documents. So we can tokenize them using NLTK since we did something different than simple free process. We could just apply simple free process here, but I'm kind of trying to show you a couple different ways. So NLTK dot tokenize dot word tokenize does the snowball mm -hmm. Porter snow snowball snowball stem snowball what's the other one called Porter stimmer snowball Lancaster so it's Porter Stimmer, uh, which is an old version of Snowball, is what it does. Uh, but tokenize for every text piece in our data set. And then we'll just build our training model. Okay. Now, one thing I could do is build a bunch of these models. So I could vary the size and the window and see which one has the best prediction. So this is how when I said like you can build a bunch of different models, these are the two parameters that I think generally you'd want to manipulate and maybe min count and then use the accuracy of your final model as the metric to determine which one of these works best. So is it 100 dimensions or should I use 200 dimensions? Test both, see what happens. All right, so we have our model. But how do we get our features out of this? So I could grab words by hidden dimensions, but I don't need words by dimensions, I need documents by dimensions. And that's the problem. We're trying to predict each of these documents, but what I have is a matrix of words by dimensions. And so the feature set needs to be documents by dimensions, which is what we could do with a topics model or an LSA. So we're not actually limited to just doing this word to back. We just trying to show you something different here. And what we want to do is convert these word vectors into a kind of um, documents by features matrix. And converting it back to the center of documents by features, we can treat, treat this like any machine learning problem. And so this is the function for it. It's kind of gross, but essentially what it does is it grabs the vocabulary, which is the list of words in your model, and it takes for each document, it finds the vocabulary and then averages those word vectors. So it creates the, it takes those dimensions, right? So our, our hidden layer and says, well, document one has, you know, this context and this context and this context and this context across all these dimensions and then like smushes them up. So you have the relationship of document one to dimension one because document one has these vectors, right? um, these little word context pieces. So essentially it is um, creating this like document dimension relationship by averaging all the context in those documents, all the dimension vectors down and you know you do lose some information that way but it's a good way to represent documents by dimensions instead of words by dimensions because we're trying to predict the documents not the words all right and that's that is the short version of what this does okay. basically kind of adds up all the feature vectors and divides by the total number of feature vectors so it's kind of it's a simple average um, but you have to remember that's averaging over these complex embeddings. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my training, right? um, my training uh, data with our original word to vec model that's on the training data and say give us back you know, documents by dimensions. And we actually do the same thing with the test data. So the test data has never been seen by the model. So we put in the tokenized test and it will actually calculate the documents by dimensions matrix given the original model seeing this new data. 
So it just, you know, kind of creates, you know, given the same original dimensions, here's what the test data's dimensions would look like. Um, I am going to assume that you remember a little bit from our logistic regression uh, lecture a couple weeks ago. Um, and we didn't cover a whole lot of Python. Did we do Python at all? I don't think we did it at all. But remember back to logistic regression, okay, uh, which is a math function. I hate when people think, call things machine learning algorithms. I'm like, logistic regression is a statistic. It's a math. It's a function. <laughs> So it's um, a way that we can predict categories that a lot of machine learning people like to use. This is me being a statistician right now. Um, so we've got our data, our dimensions, documents by dimension. Now let's use log to determine if we can predict the output, which is the category that those documents go into, now given dimensionality. So we found a way to predict because we've converted this from words into numbers. All right, and then I'm going to give you like this is very, very brief, very brief. Um, how do we know a model is good? Okay, so in the non-statistics versions, but models that are good when it comes to machine learning are things that have high accuracy scores. This is also true for statistics, but we're going to ignore p-values now. High precision scores. So this is the number of times that we got it correct um, for an individual class, given the times that we guessed and we were wrong. A high uh, recalls, our recall scores, which is the number of times the correct for a given class, divided by kind of the misses. Um, and good models have all three. And then F1 scores is an average of precision and recall. And so this kind of can be represented um, by confusion matrix. So um, confusion matrices are for each class. So for PHP, for Python, for C++, um, it's the way that we can calculate all those statistics. So for the example here, my actual value, uh, a lot of people use medical term, like medical examples for this, like a positive, if you want to talk about the world right now, a positive COVID test versus a positive test, sorry, versus actually having it or not. Like, People talk about all the statistics. I'm like, do we even know if the test is any good? <laughs> right? So sometimes people talk about positive predictive value. So how good is that test? Positive, uh, negative predictive value. If you have a negative, how likely is it that you're actually negative? Um, we could talk about sensitivity and specificity. How sensitive is the test? How specific is the test? Uh, in statistics, sometimes these matrices are used for talking about type 1 and type 2 error and power. So this is a, a, a representation of a lot of different ways to think about getting things correct. Right? And we basically did confusion matrices last week for similarity. Uh, so let's talk about them in the terms of machine learning here. Okay, so um, positive predict sorry positive predictive uh, predictive value here. Let's say we predict that the um, outcome is Python. So this Stack Overflow piece is Python, because I didn't put a tag on it, and we need to add a tag to it. Then we'll let you post without a tag, but let's pretend. Okay. So we predicted it was Python. Okay. If it actually was Python, we got it right. It's a true positive. If it was actually C++, we got it wrong. It's a false positive. Okay. Um, and so sometimes that's called false alarm. Okay. And so a measure of, of, of precision here is these false positives. So it's true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. Okay. And so if this score is low, you're either never getting true positives or you're false alarming a lot. You guess a lot and you're just crying wolf would be the example. Okay. Now um, for, let's go back, sorry, recall, what we're interested in is down. So we said it was Python. Um, here, we, predi we predicted it was Python, and it actually is, right? So true positive. Here, we predicted it was C++, and we're, we're, we're wrong. It's actually Python. It's a false negative. We missed it. We put it in the wrong category. Okay. So recall is a measure of true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. Okay. Accuracy is a measure of the diagonal. Okay. 
right. So how many times you just got it right, which is true positives and true negatives. Now there are other ways that we could calculate. We could calculate instead of um, you know down and across. We could calculate uh, uh, down for both of them or across for both of them. But most machine learning stuff is going to use precision and recall. Okay. <clears throat> so let's build them up. My tags here. So my three outcomes are Python, PHP, and C++. Uh, Scikit Learn here, the linear model is the logistic regression. So remember the rules for Python: build a blank model, add data to it. So here's our blank model. Uh, for a while, uh, Scikit Learn was going through a painful update, and you had to tell it which solver to use. This is the default now. The multi-class option is fixed as well, where it um, will uh, go to OVR when there's more than two and go to binary when there's um, only two, but it doesn't hurt if you define it either. I have these two defined specifically because for a while some folks had an old version and I had a new version and it was acting up. So um, I think that's pretty well ironed out, but these are the kind of normal options for uh, uh, multinomial logistic regression. And then I just turned up the iterations. All right, and then we fit data to it. So we do dot fit. We put in our, our, our training data and our training answers. And so this is now our predictive model. And so we use dot predict on the test data. And so that will create us this outcome list of the likelihood of each category and so basically it picks the category with the highest probability and now I want to know like did I get it right so let's see accuracy score here is a function in uh, scikit-learn that you do predicted test um, you actually I think you're actually supposed to do them the other way around but for accuracy it doesn't matter which one you put first because it's the same either way um, I think it's actually supposed to be test and then predicted. Let me fix that. But 93%. Darn, that's good. The better function, personally, is this classification report function. It's also in scikit-learn. So you put in the actual data, the actual answer, the predicted answer, and this does matter. Put them in the right order. Um, and then the target name, so it'll print them out here. And this is critical. I've seen a lot of of places that are just like, well, the accuracy was 85%, um, so it's a good model. I'm like, but how accurate are you at predicting each category? Because models that have an imbalance in their categories can be very predictive, but not useful. So what can happen is, let's say that there were 200, uh, there were like five Python cases. This is extreme, but, um, and everything, there was just, uh, for some reason, everybody was super fascinated with PHP, which there are days that, Right. Um, and the ratio of cases was highly imbalanced towards one of them. We talked about this in, when we did log before. And um, what that means is that the model will easily have a high accuracy because if you guessed all of them were PHP, you would probably be right most of the time. So if you always guess tails, you'll be right 50% of the time. Okay. Um, so we always want to check the, the predictiveness of each category to know that they're all at least getting predicted somewhat. A okay, chance here would be 33%. So we want it to be better than that. Uh, so I, I just will see people print out these reports and say the model predicted well, and then one of the categories, like precision score is zero. <laughs> so that's not good if you see that. But here in this example, we're predicting really well. All of them are above 90%. There's no good cutoff score here, but we're doing pretty good for a model with 100 dimensions. So do I need more dimensions? I don't know. It'd be hard to push this much higher, I think. Now, let's briefly also do fast text. Um, just as a comparison point to, to back to our question from earlier, um, I like using Gentum because it's all consistent and I can remember the code, but obviously there is a fast text 
I thought for some reason they only did it in this weird command line version, but I can clearly read right here where it says Python. Um, but I have not tried to install their package. I know um, one of my students is working on doing some fast tech stuff, and he's having a lot of trouble with it. And this dude's really smart, so I was like, why don't you just use Jensen? It's easy. So that's my personal preference. But let's let me show you how similar it is. Um, okay, so fast text is Facebook's version of Word to Vec. I don't really know what to do with it, but they train models and do stuff with it. Right. And they claim it's better at representing rare or idiosyncratic events. And that's the website we were just looking at. Now the cool thing is it has the exact same arguments. And so the switch between the two is literally just changing gensum.models.fasttext, right, from word to vec to fast text. So I can, in the same document, using the exact same type of code, build both and test them against each other. Okay. Now I haven't um, uh, defined the SG argument here, so we're doing SIBO models for both of these. So fast text again is just a, a different implementation of word to vec, so it has the same features, SIBO versus Skipgram. And so we're doing SIBO models here. We could also uh, test a Skipgram model, see if it gets us a better prediction. So we're going to use the exact same document flattening functions. So I'm going to vectorize it in the same way, and this is one reason I really I really like this is because I don't have to recreate the wheel here at the flattening functions because it's the same um, matrix output says it's the same package. Same logistic regression and let's see. So we built ourselves another a new blank model. We just overwrote the original. We fit our fast text training features. We predicted the test features. Fast text test features. <laughs> And we got 92%, basically the same. If I look at the inner workings of the model, we're just losing like really like 1% here and 1% somewhere else. So I would argue that these are the same model. They're very, very similar. Maybe a slight advantage for the word to vec model. Slight. And I would argue that talking about code is a fairly unique and idiosyncratic type of text. Um, versus just your normal like subtitles kind of text, but it's just as good. So I don't have a reason to prefer one or the other. And they run in about the same speed for this size of data. I do think fast text is, is faster with larger data sets. <clears throat> Hence the name. Now that's where we're going to stop so that we have time to ask questions. But if you're interested in doc to vec, let me just show you the like very, very brief, what does Doc2Vec add? And Doc2Vec literally uh, um, takes a word to vec model and adds a marker for what document it is. So instead of just kind of assuming that these are a lot of different um, representations of the same thing, it kind of holds on to this document marker. Uh, and it depends on the type of model. It's very similar to code one of these. Uh, I wanted to show like um, the output real quick. Um, so you can go through these because the, the, the coding for it's a little different because it's got more complex features, but it does not predict very well. So on that exact same data set, uh, comparing WordVec to DoctorVec is just total crap. Like, it's not a good model. And here's an example of what an accuracy report or classification report looks like with no predictiveness. Okay, it actually should give you a warning. Yeah, so there's a warning here. Um, precision and F are ill-defined because there are no predicted samples. If you see that, that's a very important warning. That means that one of your categories did not get predicted at all. So it's trying to divide by zero. <laughs> He's not very happy about it. All right. <clears throat> so be sure you check that. But I also don't want to go over, so we will leave Doctivec there and end in summary. Um, there's a really cool section on Doctivec from the book 
that is a Python notebook on the books uh, GitHub page if you want to learn more. Um, the pro my issue with Doctivex is it adds an extra layer of complexity that I have not found to be necessary. Right, so adding that extra document vector does not seem to ever help. It just adds more complexity, so the models take longer to run, um, which is, you know, in an analytics sense, is never good because that's more computing time you're paying for, um, and they don't predict. So I have, I have never used one outside of class because every time I have, I'm like, this is a waste of my time. But they have their scenarios where they've been, it's been good. So again, it depends on the task. Um, so the whole gist of this chapter really is that we can use um, what we know about the brain to build models that represent a better picture of language than just a simple bag of words. So bag of words models really represent how people kind of summarize. There's a big summary of the text and here's my kind of representation of the mental picture of the text. Whereas neural net models are better at capturing these like unique contexts. Okay. Um, and that may more accurately represent what the brain is doing. And then we'll get into deep learning models next week where we're kind of trying to capture more of those processes. Uh, so we talk about fast text and word to vec. And then you want to learn more doc to vec, which we can use to um, build these cool models and kind of explore them, or we can use them in a really nice way to predict things, because that's a lot of what analysts are doing with this kind of data is prediction or classification. And there are many other algorithms that you can use. We could do support vector machines, though your favorite, maybe gradient boost, um, Bayes, right? This doesn't really doesn't really do random forest very well, but you can pick your favorite algorithm. I just did log because we've already covered log. Um, and the, I think the nice thing about the fast text package that you mentioned uh, and or some other um, pre-built models from the subtitles projects is that you can, if you don't want to train a model, you just want to use a model, um, there are pre-trained models for specific lexicons. So, you know, English, uh, German, Dutch, Hindi, that kind of stuff. So if you have a task in which you don't want to build a model and you think that English as a whole representation is a good picture of your data, then you can preload a specified model. So that saves you time. I tend to find to like that I'm going to build my own because I have context specific question but that's because I'm doing specific research papers on like specific stuff. 